independence, love, social convention, gender roles, and religion. Charlotte Bronte's most famous novel challenges ideas on all these topics, and we are here to discuss it. I'm Charlene. And I'm Mike. And this is Jane Eyre Files. Chapter 12. The Promise of a Smooth Career. Hello, husband. Hello, ma bonne amie. Oh, I am your good friend. Good friend, <laughs> en Francaise. Again, not too many descriptions of Jane in this chapter, mm-hmm. but we do get little Adele wishing her off in French, so I got something to Pulled work with. Yeah. yeah, good for Adele. This is going to be a fun chapter. Well, this it's a very is, important chapter. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's got one of the, obviously the most important characters in the book and one, one, one of the most important characters in literary history. I agree. And then, <laughs> but it also has, I mean, you just get more vivid descriptions of the surroundings. You know, I really mm-hmm. think like Charlotte does such a great job of, of painting a picture. Yeah. And we get, you know, this incredibly pivotal scene that is, it, it begins long before that, like... Rochester, you you see him, you hear him, you hear his horse, you hear his dog oh. long before he shows up. Sure, it's, yeah. I, I, it's, when you're, when I'm reading, up. yeah, when you're reading it, it's like, okay, this is. I, I was, I'm so impressed. I, I continue to be impressed with the way Charlotte <laughs> writes. But uh, all right, yeah, I'm looking forward to, to this. Let's get into the Spark Note summary of Chapter Twelve. Jane finds life at Thornfield pleasant and comfortable. Adele proves to be exuberant and intelligent though spoiled and at times a bit petulant. Nonetheless, Jane is frequently restless and collects her thoughts while pacing Thornfield's top story passageway. One evening, a few months after her arrival at Thornfield, Jane is alone watching the moon rise when she perceives a horse approaching. It calls to her mind the story Bessie once told her of a spirit called a guy trash, which disguises itself as a mule, dog, or horse to frighten belated travelers. Oddly enough, A dog then appears as well. Once she realizes that the horse has a rider, the uncanny moment ceases. Just after the horse passes her, it slips on a patch of ice, and its rider tumbles to the ground. Jane helps the man rise to his feet and introduces herself to him. She observes that he has a dark face, stern features, and a heavy brow. He is not quite middle-aged. Upon re-entering Thornfield, Jane goes to Mrs. Fairfax's room and sees the same dog, Pilot, resting on the rug. A servant answers Jane's queries, explaining that the dog belongs to Mr. Rochester, who has just returned home with a sprained ankle, having fallen from his horse. What a coincidence. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I'm sure that's not the the same man who was just passed her on the the causeway there. Yeah, and I think something we will get into perhaps on this episode is um, we reference a lot of the film and TV adaptations that have been made of Mm. Jane Eyre. And it's funny to think, I read this book five years ago when we first met. And then I've watched the 73 adaptations that you've shown me <laughs> of Jane Eyre. And I feel like I know the adaptations a little bit more, more so than the book. Right. Especially. It creates a more visual memory for you. Yeah. And then when I, and then when I'm going back and reading the book, I'm like, oh, wait, is that how it happened? Mm-hmm. Cause I swear in the, in all the film adaptations, it seems like Jane is the cause of the horse. Slipping. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or, or just bucking Rochester yeah. off. And yeah. so, and whereas like she's in the middle of the road or something, whereas in this, in, in the book, no, no, the horse has passed her, but the dog has passed her by, right. the horse has passed her by mm-hmm. and then slips on the ice and then she turns around. And then, I, and then I, I totally forgot that the way I can picture the film adaptations is when Jane comes back to Thornfield, Rochester's waiting for her in, oh, by the yeah. fire. And that's how she finds out it's him. Right. I didn't realize it was, is it Leah? The servant who tells him, "Oh yeah, Mr. Rochester's here." He's mm-hmm. like, "Oh what?" Yeah. Like I, I thought it was more of that. And maybe it's because it, it looks better cinematically. Sure. To and have this big more reveal. Economy of time here, and they want to get to the next scene quickly. That's true. Isn't I mean I, I know I can't ask you to recall every single adaptation, but for some reason I can picture like Orson Welles sitting by the fire and just waiting for Joan Fontaine, and then she walks into the room and it's like, "Oh, it's you!" Like as compared to somebody else telling her. Yeah, I think I think that happens. That's one of the more one. vivid ones I remember yeah. where it's like I mean, there, she... there are a few, like you said, where they where she just comes home and maybe 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 Miss Fairfax comes up to her and she says, Oh, Mr. Rochester's here and he his horse just slipped. But That's yeah, I funny. think <laughs> I, I saw a guy whose horse slipped as well. 
There's so many uh, men out there slipping on the ice. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, okay, we're, we're jumping ahead to Mr. Rochester, but at the beginning of this chapter, Jane is settling in at Thornfield, describing how she has intera- her interactions with Miss Fairfax and Adele and the other servants. And the way that she describes them, it just seems very circumspect and clinical. Like she's just, there's not a lot of affection and she's she's very honest about her feelings and her judgment of them. And like after four months, you know, she has gotten to know them and she describes them in a way that just seems a little blasé. Cold. And, yeah. And I guess it seems appropriate, probably. Just, you know, I'm sure Mrs. Fairfax, she's not the most thrilling uh, conversationalist. And Adele, mm-hmm. you know, she's a little spoiled brat sometimes. That could, mm-hmm. uh, get to get to some people. But we've had some moments throughout the book of Jane being a little judgmental. Yeah. Right. And this uh, is just... but I feel like I get I, I get more of a sense of that in this one. Oh yeah. As as an adult, you know, maybe through her filter, she's a little uh, more judgmental than she would have been as a child because she's more passionate. But here, she's more restrained and she she can express herself very well of how she feels about these people. And uh, the descriptions are that like Miss Fairfax is placid tempered and kind natured. So it's not it's not um, all negative. But she just, she weighs them very evenly. And I think that's very interesting because she's a narrator. So we get to know that she's going to be an honest narrator and honestly share her feelings with us. Oh, okay. That's how it is. It's honest, not judgment. Well, I mean, I I don't know. I I guess in a way, I think, well, that seems like a true portrait of these people. Sure, sure. Maybe, like you said, if you're you're seeing them every day and you're not really going anywhere and you're at home, then maybe you... You tend to, you might temper your description a little bit and just be like, oh, okay, this is what they're like. Yeah, or, it's not know. new and fresh and yeah. and, they're, and she's just bored a little bit. And it seems like even her descriptions of like Grace Poole and also Adele's teacher, Sophie, or Adele's her nurse. nurse, Sophie, you know, they're very blunt. And I'm like, and I, I was going to ask you, like, do you think her boredom at, at Thornfield is making her a little snippy? <laughs> well, I can see maybe she has nothing else to do. So she just paints these uh, character portraits in her mind of how these people are. I don't know how much actual, like, conver- uh, definitely she hasn't had any conversations with Grace Poole, really. And then Sophie, I guess she said that she can't really speak to her because her answers aren't. What did she say? Something about. Um... Yeah, she says the her answers were vapid and confused. Yeah. You know. <laughs> That's a little harsh <laughs> no. so then we uh, we get to a part of this book that that I, I feel like it's very important sets up for her character sets up for the ideas that this book is a sort of a feminist proto-feminist tract where Jane is talking about her restlessness and that she she wants she wants to see more of the world but she feels stifled by the quiet ways of Thornfield and even though Mrs. Fairfax warned her that the winter months can be quiet at the hall, you know, she still, she wants more to do more and to see more than she has been doing in this little, um, in this house. Mm. Yeah, I just, I find that very ironic because little miss, no possibility of taking a walk that day, <laughs> seems to be really unhappy to be staying oh, at home. She's going on a lot of walks, uh, apparently, at the end, or towards the end of this chapter. But... Yeah, I thought there was, like, there's at least, I, I got three interesting quotes that I wanted to, to bring up real quick. And it's all about descriptions about being active, mm-hmm. which I hadn't seen, you know, I don't know if we've seen that much in the book. I mean, I, mean, I feel like, it, you know, the, the quote at the beginning, if there being no possibility, was less about her not wanting to go outside, but more about her not wanting to be with her family or with the, the reeds. And then also the fact that it's but cold and rainy. She didn't like the walk. She wanted to stay home and read yeah, and all that. it's cold and rainy. Nobody wants to go out. Well, yeah. But so, <laughs> so January and Thornfield rolls around and now she's wanting to get out in the dead of winter. Oh, no. Well. But I, like I said, there was there was three particular quotes that were that were drawn to me about this idea of being more active. Uh, and the first one is, she says, quote, It is in vain to say human beings ought to be satisfied with tranquility. They must have action and they will make it if they cannot find it. Mm-hmm. End quote. Uh, the second one was, quote, I was pleased to have done something. Trivial, transitory, though the deed was, it was yet an active thing. And I was wary of an existence all passive. Yeah. End quote. And then the last one is cut to the very end after the meeting with Rochester and she goes back home and she says, quote, I did not like reentering Thornfield to pass its threshold was to return to stagnation. Right. Quote. 
And it was like, it, it seems so funny where we were only, what, a chapter removed from this great new beginning. And now she Aww. has this great new house. It's just <laughs> all these other adventures she can go on. And then all of a sudden, within one chapter, a few winter months hit. Uh-huh. And then now she's just bored out of her mind. Yeah. And, you know, you're wondering, does she want to stay at this job? That seems like... Can you get give it a, give it a bit? Maybe <laughs> maybe we're just a little spoiled because we've spent the last two years living <laughs> at, at home, home. Mm, you know. Yeah. So I'm like, I, I've learned that it's not. It, you can make it well, what it is. Especially she, if didn't, got, she didn't have Netflix or. Well, uh, <laughs> but at least she has companionship. It, different if it was just a big empty house. Oh, she's at yeah. least got some people. Some people who are they're not quite her age. She's in that weird middle gap where mm-hmm. she's got a bunch of forty year olds. Plus middle-aged women, and, Fairfax, and, and then a child. Servants too. Yeah, you know, I don't know if servant or John and his wife. Are, how they're probably got to be much older. There's no, there's nobody there that's a teenager. No, no, pretty much, I right? Think so. I think there's probably some labor laws that would prevent that. Unless uh, you're a not governess. at that time, maybe. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I guess that you know that all go, wraps around the idea that you know at that time in, in the Victorian era, you know, women's place was said to be in the home where she was in charge of the domestic functions and she was a dutiful wife and mother. So there were not a lot of options available for women, like educated or gentry women who were, they weren't expected to go out into the world or to make big decisions about themselves. So I feel like one of the ways that Jane Eyre is a great feminist novel is that Jane makes a lot of important choices in her life and follows through. And so like, you know, when Jane is unhappy in a situation, she can and will move on and find something better for herself. So it's it's not, you know, it's not a significantly feminist statement by today's standards, but at the time it gave a strong voice to women who were not content to follow, you know, conventional thinking. Yeah, and she's rising above, I would say, humble beginnings. She's had a weird life where it was like she went from privilege to awful conditions yeah. to... Sort of, I wouldn't say privileged necessarily, but she is living in a, in a, in a somewhat of a comfortable life. Yeah, now. that's true. You know, it's it's easy to say pick herself up by the bootstraps, but like like I, th- I think we mentioned it before, what would have happened if she hadn't gone to Lowood? Would she stayed have just stayed with Lowood, the Reeds, yeah. uh, Gateshead? You know, would she have just been? She would have just been there, and she probably would have been raised as a proper yeah. lady or whatever. But then probably that's... have to get married and uh, yeah. become a wife and mother, and then it becomes a Jane Austen book. Yeah. <laughs> and nobody wants that because we're already tired of the people, you know, confusing Jane Eyre for Jane Austen. <laughs> so, but, so thank you, Charlotte Bronte. Yeah, and like I said, I think we, I, I just as I just mentioned a second ago, like, do you really think that Jane would have been happier staying at Thornfield? Like, was she already getting bored and looking for another job? You know, because it just seems yeah. to me like you can. Well, at least if things wait hadn't and... changed, I wonder what she would have done. Yeah. Do you or, think she would have? Got, it just seems like at least wait till the summer, right? Oh, like well, it's, probably it would have been difficult to find a job in the dead of winter. Maybe not a lot of people are thinking about bringing more people into their home at that time. Yeah. But I don't know. I, I feel like if Jane is is really was really unhappy, she might have tried to find a new position. I think maybe maybe become a teacher somewhere. Maybe she missed having a lot more kids around, so there's a lot more things to mm. do. A lot more life. I feel like I did. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe there's not. Maybe did they have? Did they mention having animals? Are there animals at Thornfield? You know, oh, just like any, pets. Just anything to kind oh. of have that that clatter. That that that's just some kind of noise and voice of of life. I just, mm-hmm. I just, I still feel like maybe it's again. You have you've only lived in California, so mm-hmm. you don't know what it's like. That's that's what winter's like, and it's easy oh. to get season that seasonal get affective and... <laughs> disorder or whatever. Where if you yeah. look out the window in the window, middle of winter, you you long for something better, but then it's like she's got this nice house and she's got a mm-hmm. really good you know decent job and people who are you know, kind to her. She's got a she's staying got a roof over her head, and yeah. I'm sure there's probably plenty of books in the library that she could read. And yeah. I feel like you got at least get through one year before you before you start to move on that's that's kind of how i feel i guess oh no i mean i don't know she probably would have she probably would have stuck it out maybe maybe see adele uh, until she's a little bit older or a little bit more advanced in her english and then she would have felt uh, okay to leave i don't know Mm -hmm. but she doesn't get that chance because the master of thornfield is returning to the hall and jane doesn't quite know that yet but with this first meeting with Mr. Rochester, it's a compelling first meeting because it's so unromantic. And, you know, 
I I always think of this first meeting as being sort of anti fairy tale. You know, where uh, in a fairy tale, man would just like sweep a woman off her feet, but instead, Mister Rochester falls off his horse, and he is at Jane's feet, and depending on her to get him home. I I disagree on the point that he's depending on her to help him get home. Oh, wow. I think he plays that up. Really, <laughs> I really, I really do. I think I think he's he knows what he's doing. He he doesn't he doesn't need her help to get home. But oh. I think he's he's sort of enjoying the the scene because he has. Now that he knows who she is, once he mm-hmm. learns who she is, mm-hmm. I think it takes on a whole different, a different. That different he's having take. fun. Well, it's just I don't know. There's some kind of advantage of knowing who somebody is without them knowing who you are, perhaps. Mm-hmm. And so I think you just wanted to kind of get some, figure out who she was. I guess. Okay. Because yeah. she's going to be she's going to be his employee in some reg- in, in some regard. Yeah. And so it's like, okay, how how long can I get away with this before she figures <laughs> out who I am? But yeah. Well, he gets he gets away with it for a long time, but mm-hmm. I think it's it's uh, intriguing that this is just a immediate reversal of gender roles, and Jane feels a little more fulfilled by being able to help someone instead of being the damsel in distress. Had he been a handsome, heroic young gentleman, I should not have dared to address him, but his frown and the roughness of his manner set me at once at my ease. If you are injured, sir, I can fetch help either from Thornfield Hall or the village. Oh, thank you. I shall do. <laughs> I have no broken bones, only a sprain. You may go on. I cannot think of leaving you, sir, until I see you are fit to mount your horse. Yeah, I like how Jane's not, you know, shy or bashful around Rochester, since she doesn't consider him to be that handsome. Mm-hmm. You know, which is funny. I feel like people can be more comfortable if there's not, you know, this instant attraction. You know, I think she's also intrigued by, like, his gruff persona. And I immediately made, it made me think of like pickup artists. Yeah. You know, there's, that, there's that term, the the neg. Right. Like he's so kind of mean to her at first. I mean, yeah. I mean, we don't know if he likes her as well. Like maybe he does. It's just, it's a, it's only a chance meeting. He hasn't, he hasn't had an opportunity to, to really look close enough at her. She's just some teenage girl taking a letter to the mm-hmm. post office, but he's kind of, he's having a little fun with it, you know? But then of course he himself gets more comfortable after he figures out who she is and learns that she's the governess, I look. There's a line where he says, "Necessity compels me to make you useful," <laughs> and I just think that's kind of a baller move. Oh, really? Like he, pro- I mean, he probably could have gotten up, but then he's just he's just sort of like, "Oh, okay. Well, I know that you're gonna. I'm gonna see you around the house. Mm-hmm. So let me go ahead and just see how helpful Put you she use is. Already? Well, yeah, yeah, and see if she's as as friendly and if she could kind of get a good idea if this is a good governess or not. Is she mm-hmm. going to willing to help? Somebody else. Because doesn't he, like, you know, at first, he doesn't really talk to her, you know, and what, until they kind of open up. And then, as soon as he finds out she's the governess, then all of a sudden it's like, oh, okay. Now I can find oh. myself sort of being a little bit more comfortable. And that was, I, kinda, I wanted to pose the question to you, which was, do you think he would have even asked for help if she wasn't the governess? I feel like he didn't want her help. Um, until she kind of like pushed herself on, like asking, "Oh, how how are you?" Mm-hmm. And I can't go without seeing that you're fine. And so that he's just like, "Okay, I guess." You know, he begrudgingly probably, does it. Yeah, and then I mean, as soon he as probably she says, would have gritted his teeth against the pain and just found, yeah. you know, I don't know. Maybe I feel like a sprained ankle. I've had a sprained ankle before. It's it's a little bit hard to get around without a prop of some sort. Mm-hmm. So I can understand him needing her help and trying to get to the horse or. Trying to bring the horse to him, but yeah, he's I close to home. He's I'm like I just I just feel like he, he, in my opinion he can't take out a cell phone, make a well, phone call. No, no, of course. <laughs> in my opinion, yeah, it's a medical alert bracelet. Uh, <laughs> I just I feel like he doesn't want her help, and he's just like begrudgingly getting into this conversation with her. Okay, yeah, sure. Oh yeah, where you know are you? Oh yeah, you're you're down there. And as soon as it's yeah. like, oh, you're in Thornfield. You yeah, know, a, little, a little more interest, obviously, yeah, because he yeah. doesn't know who she is. And he's like, even if, if he didn't want her help, if it wasn't, like I said, if she wasn't the governess, he's still close enough to home that I think he would have just, like you said, would have just gritted his teeth through it. I don't think he would have asked for, mm. for help. He wouldn't have, and he definitely wouldn't have leaned on her shoulder yeah. to help himself up and then been like, oh, my whip's over there. That's, <laughs> like I said, he's just, he's kind of messing with her at that point. You know. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know if I completely agree, but I could see that he has that sense of humor, so that would fit. And speaking of his sense of humor, do you think that it's uh, a little cruel that Mr. Rochester doesn't tell Jane who he is when they first meet? I don't know about cruel. Yeah. I think, I mean, that's not the right, maybe, maybe a bit peculiar. 
Yeah. You know, I mean, I think perhaps he doesn't want special treatment from her if he, if she finds out that he's her employer. Right. Mm. You know, and like I said, maybe he's still kind of feeling her out, you know, and I just, like I said, it, I think it's easier to get to know somebody if you might have a little bit of an advantage on them. Right. You know, if you know a little bit more. I mean, the funny thing is, you know, we're recording this on a day. Last night, Charlene and I watched uh, a movie called The Shop Around the Corner, mm -hmm. which, of course, was remade years later as You've Got Mail with Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan. But this Shop Around the Corner is Jimmy Stewart and Margaret Sullivan. Sullivan, yeah. And uh, this idea that there are these two pen pals. They, they, they don't like each other in real life, but then pen pals, are they're getting along great. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as one of them finds out who the other one is first, mm -hmm. then they kind of hold that they over them. They have a little bit of yeah, power. Yeah, it's, sure. it's a little bit, it allows them to kind of manipulate, not in a bad way, but just sort of form the conversation yeah. and, and ask the right questions that mm -hmm. you would necessarily, if it, was, if it was just a random person, you know, or if it was just some person, you're just like, okay, I want to meet this person and get to know them. Whereas if you already know who they are, then you can ask more pointed questions. Mm -hmm. You don't have to ask just the generic ones. Yeah, that's and, true. Yeah. Well, I don't I got to say, Shop Around the Corner, you know, this is the first time I'd ever seen that movie. So charming. I just, I really enjoyed it. So I highly recommend it if anybody wanted a little Christmassy fi film to end out this year. But uh, I also wanted to mention that I think it's funny that Jane, you know, I, I don't know, maybe I would have been a little upset if, you know, I, I had met my employer and they didn't mention anything. And they knew that they knew who I was. And I just think it's interesting that Jane doesn't even comment on it, that she... Yeah doesn't seem that much bothered by it which you know that's that's great of jane like she's just that lets it roll roll off her back well and also you gotta, you gotta mention this is an autobiography right mm -hmm. like that, that that's a little clever way to write it you know because she already knows who he is as she's writing the book oh yeah but yet when she describes their first meeting you know oh, she well, makes yeah. it a point to like oh i'm not gonna tell the reader oh who he is <laughs> You know, even Are you though, saying she's pulling the wool over our eyes as well? Yes. See, and we're, so we're, it's we're fun. In her, yes, we're in her position. So. Yeah, it's totally fun. Like, I can understand why Rochester did it, because Charlotte Bronte seems to enjoy doing it as well. <laughs> oh, well, that's true. You live just below, the house with the battlements? Yes. Whose house is it? Mr. Rochester's. Do you know him? No, I've never seen him. Hmm, the governess. Deuce take me if I'd not forgotten. The governess. No, I cannot commission you to fetch help. But you may help me a little if you'll be so kind. Your shoulder. Only necessity, you understand, <coughs> compels me to make you useful. Hey, hey, hold still. <coughs> Thank you. I make haste to post your letter and return as fast as you can. So in our previous episode of the podcast, we talked about how we get the first real description of what Jane looks like. And in this chapter, we get a good description of what Mr. Rochester looks like. We'll get a little bit more later, but I wanted to do what we did in the last episode, which was show Mike the police sketch from the composites blog of Mr. Rochester, where they, they basically had a police sketch artist draw Mr. Rochester according to the description. But first... What was, uh, the, what was the description? Here? Yes, I'll read the description. His figure was enveloped in a riding cloak, fur-collared and steel-clasped. Its details were not apparent, but I traced the general points of middle height and considerable breadth of chest. He had a dark face with stern features and a heavy brow. His eyes and gathered eyebrows looked ireful and thwarted just now. He was past youth, but had not reached middle age. Perhaps he might be 35. So... Let's show you this photo. Whoa. <laughs> oh, wow. That's not quite what I expected. No. Looks like the singer of a 70s garage rock band. <laughs> Sideburns, right? Yeah. Sideburns. I think they mentioned, not, not in this part of the book, but he has like a horizontal sweep of the brow or something like that with okay. his hair where it's just like uh i don't know it's it's a little i don't i don't i don't quite like the haircut i think that's what bothers me the yeah. most about this particular photo which i'll put on the, on my instagram at air guide uh so yeah it, it's uh 
It's a picture. Yeah. I feel like both those, with all due respect to the sketch artist, I'm sure that again, these are probably professional police yeah. sketch artists. Neither of those drawings were what I pictured when I read the book. Right. And they don't seem to resemble virtually any of the actor or actresses who played them in the adaptation. Well, that's probably difficult. True. <laughs> but I don't know. It would be interesting if we could just uh, show this to Charlotte Bronte some way, somehow and just say, hey, what do you think? Is this, is this what you had in mind? <laughs> I wonder if she knew what she had in mind. Were I these think based, so. Was Rochester based on somebody real? Did she have, oh, did wow. She, did that's, she that's something we can go into in a later over, chapter. over some, uh, some well, guy at her could, church or school. We can talk about the inspiration for Mr. Rochester because that is quite a story. Okay. <laughs> something to look forward to. Always have something to look forward to, I think. Mm-hmm. And just to, to round out the interesting context in this chapter, I wanted to mention the guy trash, which in the summary, it mentioned it's a legendary black dog said to haunt the roads of northern England. And according to Wikipedia, which we always trust, right? This novel is thought to be the first reference to this creature, and it informs our understanding of the folklore, which I thought was really pretty cool that... Jane Eyre brought this idea of a guide trash uh, into more of a modern understanding. So, Mike, we have a special segment in our episode today where, you know, we talk a lot about adaptations and how much we enjoy watching them. And I think, you know, it's probably time for a new one. Uh, So, you know, just to get the ball rolling, I thought maybe I'll invite some well-known voice actors to come over and, and perhaps audition for Mr. Rochester. So let's let's welcome Mr. Matthew McConaughey to read a line as Mr. Rochester. Whoa, that's a big get. I know, right? How I did can't you believe pull that it. one off. <laughs> Hello, Charlene. <laughs> Mike, good to be here. Mr. McConaughey, thank you for coming in. Uh, my pleasure. I'm a fan of, of the Bronte sisters. <laughs> well, be, please do. Give us a, a short, quick reading of Mr. Rochester. I'm sure you know these lines very well. Oh, very well. This is from chapter 12. Yes. Uh, this is the one particular line that caught my fancy. <laughs> I should think you ought to be at home yourself. If you have a home in this neighborhood, <laughs> where do you come from? Oh, oh that amazing. Oh, my God. <laughs> That is something else. That's Mr. Rochester right oh there. Oh, my God. I think we should, his agent should be just calling the producers of whoever, next person that has the book rights. I mean, we might have a few more actors coming through, but, oh, you know, oh. we're going to, we're going to keep your information, Mr. McConaughey. Thank you so much. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> okay. So I'll just say that. Uh, I think in our marriage, I, Mike likes to make me laugh by using different voices. And I thought it would be fun to have him pretend to be a different actor pretend uh, <laughs> what are you talking I'm about i'm so sorry Matthew, Matthew McConaughey was just here no no in all seriousness there's nothing better than hearing charlene laugh and so <laughs> I, I i never thought of myself as an impressionist but i can i can i can do a few oh I yeah, a few. yeah i enjoy your impressions so right. but we might have a few more appearances in subsequent episodes yeah we were when we first mentioned this podcast and we started going into it charlene was like oh wouldn't it be funny if we you know, I want it when once Rochester shows up, the, the book's going to get so much more better. It's going to be more romantic and passionate. There's a mm-hmm. lot of great lines of dialogue, and yes. then I think I must have been doing an impression. One, I think there was one night I did like a full on twenty minute Matthew McConaughey <laughs> monologue, a McConaughey, <laughs> and uh, and then I think it kind of inspired you. We're like, oh, you should totally just have Rochester lines read on our podcast. So we'll see, we'll see how it plays. Let's see what the listeners think if we if they go, you know, kill this segment. I'll have you brush up your impressions, and yeah. uh, we'll we'll bring some more some of that back. I don't have that. And I said I'm not a man of a thousand voices. It's just a handful <laughs> of them. Let's see if they work for Rochester. Yes. Well. Again, thank you, Mr. McConaughey. So I guess now we'll get to the last part of our podcast episode where we go over a meaningful passage or quote. So Mike, can you share your passage? Uh, Yeah, my quote comes from toward the end of the chapter after Jane and Rochester have had their their first meeting. And it goes a little something like this. That's what I love about these high school girls, man. (laughs) I I get older and they stay the same age. No, that wasn't it. That wasn't it. Okay. Mr. Ricardo, I thought you left. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. So in all, in all seriousness, uh, my quote comes from Jane after she's met Rochester and then she is uh, just sort of returning to her faculties, I should say. Mm-hmm. And the quote goes, 
Quote, the new face, too, was like a new picture introduced to the gallery of memory, and it was dissimilar to all the others hanging there. Firstly, because it was masculine, and secondly, because it was dark, strong, and stern. I had it still before me when I entered Hay and slipped the letter into the post office. I saw it as I walked fast downhill all the way home, end quote. Mm. She's obsessed. Jane is smitten. <laughs> yeah. She is a smitten kitten. She is in deep smit. I, I, you know, her meeting with Rochester is not a traditional sort of meet cute moment. Mm-hmm. And that's what I think makes it so much more realistic in the way that it's presented. Like, you know, she's coming out of her comfort zone due to his appearance. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not instantly attractive, but it's enough to where it lingers in her mind, you know. Yeah. And she's same- more attracted by this potential personality. Yeah. I think. And, and like I said, she's coming to grips with a new sensation, you know, a new feeling she likely has never felt before. And mm-hmm. it kind of reminds me of, I'll ask you the question, like, which men had she met in her life so far? Oh, right. Mr. Brocklehurst. Mr. Brocklehurst. Mom likes him. The apothecary. Oh, yeah. Mr. Lloyd. Know, and Mr. Then Lloyd. John Reed. John Reed. Yeah. There's, there's, I mean, there's any other guest that came to the... Any other priest. That or came maybe to Lowood the, uh... the, when, when, they, when they would all go to church and yeah. two miles in the snow both ways and all that stuff the and people who are in charge of lowood maybe like the yeah the board of trustees or whatever no dashing men not that rochester's supposed to be dashing but no um just just a strong rugged men yeah. have been yeah. there and so i'm like you know we, we always forget you know there's no movies at this time mm-hmm. right she so doesn't have any matinee idols to oh, sure. to lust after unless she and has so... like yeah some idea from a book that she read of a character that was Kind of like Mr. Rochester, yeah. a little gruff and abrupt. Yeah, but now this is in the flesh. Yeah. And so now it's like, now I'm starting to, to realize, like, I think I mentioned to you when I first read the book five years ago that I read him as a little bit more dashing. And so when we watch oh. the adaptations, my favorite Rochester of all the adaptations was Timothy Dalton. I'm a big James Bond fan, and that's kind of how I saw him as sort of like that dashing Timothy Dalton-esque James oh, Bond type figure. Right. Okay. And then you told me that Michael Jason is the best. Yeah. <laughs> and as I've gotten to know, you know, the story a little bit better, I saw, as I've seen all the adaptations, as I've met Michael Jason, it's, not, I'm, I'm, mm. it's so cool that we get to call him a friend, yeah. you know, and to where now it's like, okay, I understand where you're coming from. Like, I'm, that's why I want to, I'm looking forward to this reread so that I can go back and look and see the way that she describes him mm-hmm. to see if he's a little less dashing in my mind. And unfortunately, which I think I know we've talked about this before. You know, sometimes when I read a book, I cast the parts in my mind. Right. Now, when I was reading chapter 12, I saw Michael Jason. Oh, that I makes now, you so happy. <laughs> I, I, just, I just see Michael Jason now when I read the book. So yeah, yeah, that's the same for me. Yeah. But still, she's a smitten kitten. <laughs> oh, yeah. So what, was, so what was your quote, Charlene? Okay. So my quote is a passage that I've always really liked. And it's long. It's only two sentences. But it's a run-on sentence. So... I think I want to read the whole the whole passage just because it's so good. Okay, so here we go. I could not help it. The restlessness was in my nature. It agitated me to pain sometimes. Then my sole relief was to walk along the corridor of the third story, backwards and forwards, safe in the silence and solitude of the spot, and allow my mind's eye to dwell on whatever bright visions rose before it. And certainly they were many and glowing, to let my heart be heaved by the exultant movement which... While it swelled it in trouble, expanded it with life, and best of all, to open my inward ear to a tale that was never ended, a tale my imagination created and narrated continuously, quickened with all of incident, life, fire, feeling mm-hmm. that I desired and had not in my actual existence. So yeah, we get a, I think we get a, a, a glimpse of Charlotte Bronte here, where she you know loved to write. We talked about that in the previous uh, episode where she wanted to write, but she had to teach these children and it really cramped her style. Mm. Um, and Jane has talk, here is talking about a tale her imagination created and narrated, something like a story that she's just telling herself, which I, I feel like it, or it shows her active imagination. And, you know, Jane, Jane longs for something. She doesn't really say what, but maybe for romance. You know, she didn't, you know, at that age, probably she doesn't really talk about men. She doesn't have any talk to talk to about men. And I feel like teenagers especially can empathize with Jane's mindset in these early chapters because I also felt restless at that age when I, when I was uh, 
thinking about where I was going to do after uh, when I leave high school and that helped my impulse to go to college far from home to see something more. Mm. So it's again just a, another way that I connected with Jane Eyre at that age and hmm. why okay. that passage is still is meaningful to me. Yeah, and it kind of shows you the depths and the layers of, of you know of Charlotte's skill. Mm. Right? I mean where you're she's telling this story, this autobiography, and yet the character is also on a tale. Like it's just a tale inside of it. Oh, the, the character <laughs> is imagining a tale in her own head. Yeah. It's a what tale is inside of a tale. It's like it's like an inc- it's like Jane Seption. <laughs> You know, like, it, it, so, yeah, no, I, I can imagine, especially, like you said, if, if you're wandering the halls of this 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 building, you can't mm-hmm. help but daydream and your mind yeah. wanders off. And sure, there's I, a lot to see. Didn't she talk about it in this chapter about how, like, she would come outside and look back at the castle? Yeah, or, look, of, or to go to the roof and look out, too. Yeah, like. and so it's, it's yeah, I can only imagine how stir-crazy you must get in a place like this. Mm-hmm. But also someone, like you said, who seems to have a pretty active imagination um, yeah. that's... Yeah, you're you're seeking that next adventure and you're longing for something. So I like that she's putting herself into her own story. Yeah, that's it's a great quote. So this is gonna this episode is gonna come out. It's gonna be the last episode of the year. So we're gonna have to wish everyone a very happy new year. I hope twenty twenty two is gonna be much better than twenty twenty one has been. <laughs> But we're we're also going to get to some very interesting chapters of Jane Eyre, so we we'll have a lot to talk about in the new year. And we'll have the is it the one hundred and seventy fifth anniversary of the publishing of Jane Eyre oh, next year? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's another mi- big milestone. You just gotta keep living, man. L I V I N. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed our podcast, please subscribe and leave us a review on your preferred podcast platform. This really helps us grow and reach new listeners. If you want to talk Jane Eyre with me online, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at airguide. That's E-Y-R-E. And if you want to hear more from me, I host my own podcast called Out of Touchstone, where my good friend Chad and I discuss all the films that Disney produced for their Touchstone Pictures label. You can also find me on Twitter at Mike DeKalb. Thank you and farewell for the present.